Hello all, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project update video for this 1-6 scale ArmorTech late production German Tiger 1. Since the last video a lot of progress has been made to the tank's upper hull as well as the tank's top deck. We'll be going over these additions in this video. And here we have the tank side skirts left stock. The way you see the side skirts in this scene are the way they are supplied with the ArmorTech kit. The design, the design itself of the ArmorTech side skirts are exactly the same on all of their Tiger One releases, no matter from their earliest all the way up to their most recent. The reason for this is that the side skirts themselves are actually very nicely done, and the kit supplies you a very decent set out of the box. The kit side skirts contain the side skirt panels, they are laser cut, pre-drilled, and are also pre-bent. Also included are the end components for the side skirts. As of note, the kit only supplies you with four of these end connectors because there are only four found on the real tank. Only the first and last side skirts on each side receive the end connector. The end connector simply gets mounted to the fender as such. Now depending on the type of tooling that you have, you can either epoxy the two components together or if you have the equipment, the two metals can easily be spot welded. For this build, I will be using solder to facilitate this join here. Also, as we can see, the panels on this model do have some surface rust in them. Now this is not normal for the kit. When you purchase the Tiger One kits directly from ArmorTech when new, all of the sheet metal components are protectively wrapped to prevent the rust from occurring. Due to the type of sheet metal that the components are fabricated out of, they will rust if left to the open air for an extended period of time. And that's what was the case of with this model. As you recall, this model was pre-started by another builder and he temporarily bolted the fenders to the side of the tank for mock-up purposes. The pieces were left unprimed and again left to the open air which caused them to develop some surface rust. Now the rust that you see on all these side skirts here it's just purely superficial and is not deep and pitting or any type of other degradation to the metal. It will be simply buffed and sanded away once the components are totally left to the bare steel again, they will be thoroughly coated with primer and which will protect them from rust for years to come. And here go the exact same side skirt panels, only with the surface rust now removed. To remove the surface rust, I went ahead and utilized 220 grit sandpaper on a palm sander, a couple swipes, and the surface rust was no longer present. With the parts all now polished up, the surface lends itself for a very nice surface to add the primer and paint to. In addition to that, it's also a perfect platform to add the mods, which will be added right now. And here go the tank side skirts, fully modified and ready for paint. The side skirts have their interior detailings added, as well as their detailing mods done to the rib. As like what was seen earlier when the side skirts were left stock, the rib was just a bent piece of steel that was pre-bent by the company. On the Tiger One, there are these little notches that are cut out of the rib in order for the fender to fit a lot, I guess, to position it easier onto the mounting bosses which are welded to the hull. The little Inlets were added via the Dremel and were filed smooth. The addition of the little notches was a very simple addition and one that helps the look of the tank. As for the interior, the corner piece that was mentioned earlier has been affixed to the fender. It is soldered on like I mentioned earlier. Also what is found on the Tiger One are other support ribs along the side skirt interior portion. This design here is typical for a Tiger built from the mid to late period which is why it features this design. 
As of note, the Tiger One featured several designs for side skirts. The Tiger One was first developed, actually had no side skirts. If I reference back to my initial Tiger One build, which is found on my video listings. The side skirts were kind of an afterthought and were actually a, a modification. The Tiger went through two different styles of side skirts in which those versions did not have any internal ribs on them. The shape was also slightly different in that they were a little bit smaller and the design, the tip over here actually curled inward. This design was adopted probably around 1942-1943 and utilized the ribs. For the ribs give more structural support to the sheet metal. Skirts themselves, there are two designs used. You have the ones that are utilized on the front and end, which have the large cutoff. And then you have the ones that are found in the center, which do not have the cutoffs on them and instead have a smaller reinforcement rib. The ribs that you see here are all scratch built out of sheet metal and are soldered to the side skirt panel just like the end connector was, which was mentioned earlier. Soldering the pieces on give them the optimal amount of strength and also give them a little bit more of a realistic look in that the solder joints replicate welds very realistically. The side skirts now will be going through their painting process, which will include a coat of primer to protect them from rust, and then a base coat of Dunkel Geld. Prior to installing the tank sheet metal work, I need to go ahead and complete the rest of the bodywork on the tank side hull. This would include the addition of the Zemrit, as well as the prime base coat, as well as the weathering for the portion that will be covered up by the tank sheet metal work. This was done to both sides of the model. The Zemrit itself was added in the exact same manner and with the exact same material that I used previously on the rest of the tank's hull components. As for why I went ahead and pre-painted and pre-weathered the components now, this is because once the tank's side skirts are added, getting to this location here will become very difficult. So adding the paint and weathering to this section here is a nice little tip on all Tiger One tank models. The same procedure was also done to the tank's side skirt rear portions. As you can see since the last scene, the side skirts have been primed, painted with their base coat, and have their weathering airbrushed on. The side skirt panels in this condition right now are now ready to be installed to the vehicle. The kit supply bosses are a very nice touch and add a lot of detail to the tank. They also help mounting on the fenders in a nice squared fashion that you see here. On some of the earlier releases of the Armortech kit, from about 10 years ago, these pieces were not included with the model and needed to be fabricated by the model maker himself. Also, since the pieces are pre-tapped and threaded, it makes installation of the fender a lot easier. The older models required the use of a nut fastener on the opposite side of the hull, which once the model was in this condition here, became very difficult to go ahead and mount on the fenders. However, that's not the case with these later versions, as they just simply bolt on in the manner that you see here. The fenders themselves are on very secure, as you can see, they are very solid and there's no play or wobble to them. They will hold up very well with the rigors of radio controlled use. Moving on to a, another important part of the hull is that of the tank's transport track cable. The Tiger One featured two sets of tow cables. You have the two main tow cables which would have been mounted on the top deck and then you have a tow cable for the use of changing out the bow track with the transport track. That cable was thinner and was mounted on the side of the driver's side of the hull. The Armor Tech kit does supply you with the tow cable as well as the provisions for mounting the cable to the side of the hull. Those provisions are look like this and come in this type of format. They are made out of what appears to be CNC aluminum and simply bolt to the side of the tank. This system is effective in that it's robust and you don't have to worry about the tow cable ever coming loose on you. Rather than using the kit components however, as they are somewhat very basic, I went ahead and scratch built the provisions that you see here. The tow cable layout breaks down as follows. 
Starting with over here, you have the clips which actually hold the cable onto the side of the vehicle. These act as like a channel and the cable just sits inside this little clip here. Over here we have two little bent type hook pieces. These are found on either side of the side of the hull and the cable actually bends around them in order to loop around to the next set of clips. Over here we have the two positions where the front and end of the cable hook up. If we notice it looks like a something that you would type, like see on a ship, almost like a cleat. This cleat here is fixed. It simply gets mounted to the side of the hull. And this cleat here is actually adjustable. It's comprised out of three pieces. Now, as of now, the layout that you see here is for a late pattern Tiger I. The earlier style Tiger I featured a slightly different format than the version here. Basically, the big difference between the two is that the earlier style Tiger I featured more of these fixed style cleats. And in the later one, they went ahead and replaced one of the fixed style with that of the adjustable one. Because of this modification, the way the layout of the cable rests on the side of the hull is slightly different. The version that we have here is very similar to that which would be found on a King Tiger. As for the components that are scratch built, they are all made out of metal. The small clips themselves are made out of a thicker gauge sheet steel. They're all bent and small copper pins were then soldered in place. Same goes for the, the loop around hook that we have here. As for the end pieces, they are fabricated out of brass. We have here a brass angle and soldered to the brass angle is the actual end cap itself. The end cap is actually modified from a 20, spent 22 caliber shell casing. It was trimmed and the maker's mark was then removed via solder. The same system was used for the adjustable version that we have here. As for the adjustable version, the way this system works is that this plate here with the milled in slot gets affixed to the vehicle's side permanently. The way it's adjusted or assembled is you have a single fastener and you have the end cap which then gets threaded onto the angle brace. With a little twist the piece can slide back and forward on the angle plate which once the cable is installed can be adjusted in order to achieve the proper tension of the cable. Once everything is installed the cable will be mounted to the vehicle nice and taut and won't have any slack to it. Due to the mild steel usage of the clips over here, the these pieces will now go into primer. Once all the components are primed, they will then be mounted to the vehicle. And here go the transport track removal cable mounts affixed to the model. The cable that will actually start from this location here, from there it will then loop around these provisions about two or three times before ending at this spot over here. More information on this is to come as the build progresses. In addition to the tank's transport track cable mounts being installed, the rest of the tank's top deck detailing has been completed as well. This would include the deck welds, the main tow cable clamps, as well as the tool posts that you see here. With the tank's main tow cable clamps, the kit does supply you with the clamps to mount on the supply tow cable. The clamps themselves are all made out of CNC aluminum and do have their basic detailing and also function very well in actually keeping everything mounted to the deck. Now, like with the transport cable mounts, the 
main cable mounts are very basic in detailing. On the model that you see here, I used half of the supplied kit ones and also replaced the other ones with that of my own resin castings. The two main mounts that you see here, which would be for the tow cable as well as the gun cleaning staves, these here are the kit, Armor Tech Kit Original. They are very nicely done and were installed right out of the box. As for the clamp mounts themselves, these ones that you see here are my own resin castings and they're fully functional. They open up, the eyelet for the cable would get mounted into this position here, and then everything is held in place via a hinged piece of brass strip and a fastener. Now the fasteners are actually threaded directly into the top deck, so no added nuts are needed on the bottom portion of the top deck, which simplifies the installation process. Also replaced from the kit originals are the two tow cable shackles that are found on the back portion of the grill work. On the real tank, the tow cable would get locked into these two positions here, and effectively they hold the cable in place and prevent it from wobbling around. Like I mentioned with the front tow cable shackles, the rear ones you see here are actually my own resting castings. Just like with the ones in the front, the fastener is actually threaded into the cast aluminum radiator cover that we have here. Now, currently not found in the scene is a small little brass strip, which once tight, which once bolted down, holds the cable in place. And on this small little eyelet here, there is an a, a wing nut which goes ahead and secures it further. The wing nut is going to be a resin casting. It's really more for detail purposes only. However, with the main fastener, it has more than enough strength to keep the heavy tow cable firmly in place. Moving our way to the rest of the top deck, starting with the tank's welds. As you can see, the top welding detail has been completed and has been added to all the components as well as to the main plate itself. Now, because the top deck is removable, the welds that you see here have been sculpted in a way so that they cover up the majority of the main seam line, which is where the two plates meet, but also must not be touching the top deck in order for the top deck to be removed without any type of snagging or any type of destruction to the sculpted welds. There is a small, very fine seam found on the top deck itself. However, it is so fine that once the vehicle is painted, it will not be noticeable. Another simple addition that was made to the vehicle was that of the center line weld bead. The Tiger One may have the appearance that the top deck is one continuous steel plate. However, that's not the case. Like the way ArmorTech designed the kit from the grill work and aft, it's a separate component from the main engine or from the main top deck. The main top deck itself is also comprised out of two steel plates. You have the left hand and the right hand plate. These two plates were then welded together via a single continuous weld bead that ran the entire length of the vehicle. The addition of the weld bead was a very simple addition, but greatly helps the accuracy of the build. For anyone who's building a smaller scale rendition of the Tiger One, it's something to keep an eye out for as many kits do not have this little bit of detailing pre-molded in. Moving on to the model's tool post, as you can see all the tool posts have been added to the vehicle. The tool posts themselves are all scratch built and none of the kit supplied basic kit clips were used. In their place, functional scratch built metal clamps were fabricated. The, the clamps themselves do have a the realistic look of the German AFV tool post. Unlike American tanks in which the tools were strapped onto the tank via leather belts or canvas belts, on German tanks they were held on with metal clamps. The kit does supply you with the tools themselves, namely the pioneer tools like the shovel as well as the large cast bronze C-clamp that we have here. The tools, the pioneer tools themselves are made out of white metal and are actually the kits supplied by armor packs. They're very nicely done and are also highly recommended. The bronze 
C uh, clamp shankle here is from another aftermarket source, however, it is supplied with the Armor Tech kit. I believe it's from the same manufacturer who produced the Bosch light, which was discussed in an earlier video. The jack block is also supplied with the kit as a basic wooden block. This block here will be used and will be upgraded with the detailing as the build progresses. As for the tool layout that you see here, this is the type of tool layout which would be standard for a late pattern Tiger 1. Tiger 1, just like with a few of the other components, had the tool posts differ for whichever period that the tank was assembled in. The earlier vehicles were, had a somewhat different format as they did not have the armored ring and they still had some provisions for that of the snorkeling equipment. The one feature that is found exclusively on late pattern Tigers is that of the C-clamp that is mounted directly to the tank's top deck. This feature here is not found on earlier production units. Also, what's found on the later pattern is that of the center-mounted Bosch light. As we recall, on the earlier pattern Tiger 1s, the lights would have been mounted in this, on these two corners here of the upper deck. In addition to that, some uh, vehicles from North Africa actually have the headlights mounted on the front glasses plate on an elevated bracket. One, the, once the headlight was narrowed down to one light and it was mounted in the center of the vehicle, the power cable was rerouted into the top deck in this location here. Like what was mentioned in a previous video, the headlight that you see here is fully functional and its cord actually emerges from the conduit like it would on the real vehicle and it enters directly into the front glasses plate. The reason why I went ahead and mounted through the front glasses plate like I mentioned before is because the top deck needs to be removable and it would be very difficult in making the power cord disconnect as it would on the real vehicle. So a dummy headlight power cord needed to be fabricated. As you see, the conduit runs into the front glasses plate, and then the dummy cord emerges from the top deck. Now, because the top deck needs to be removable, the dummy cord simply unplugs, bends out of the way, and you now have no longer an umbilical connecting to the headlight. Once the top deck is reinstalled, the power cord simply gets inserted back into the terminal box. Moving our way to the C-clamp, shackles that we have here. The shackles that we see here are not the kit originals. The kit does supply you with the components to mount this portion to the top deck and the kit ones are actually very nicely done and are very realistic. The reason why they were not used on this model was because I was unable to track down all of the components required to assemble the, the piece. Rather than trying to get replacements from Armortech, I simply just fabricated new pieces out of turned brass. The kit originals were actually made out of CNC steel. The pieces are fully functional, just like the real one as well as the kit original. The, once the shackles are removed, we can see what the component looks like. As you can see, it's just four simple posts that are directly welded to the top deck. Just like on the kit original and the real vehicle, the two posts that are for locking onto the shackle are fatter than the components for the mounting of the swivel plate. As for the units here, they are mounted to the tank via bolts. They are actually threaded directly into the top deck and are very strong and very sturdy and will not break off during operation. Which is important because the C-clamp here has a significant amount of mass to it glues and adhesives alone are not going to be enough to keep the component from breaking away. As you can see, the detail weld beads have been added and are found like this on the real vehicle. Moving our way to the shovel, like I mentioned before, the shovel spade mount itself is all fabricated out of sheet steel. It's all soldered together and is actually bolted to the deck, just like on the real vehicle, with these small micro fasteners. No adhesives were used, and the, the component is actually bolted to the top deck, which again, will give it a lot of sturdiness and robustness to protect it from the rigors of radio controlled use. The axe head 
Mount is another component that is scratch built. It's made out of the same type of material as the shovel protector and is also soldered together. Mounted to the deck, the shovel will actually, the head will lock into this position here and it actually prevents it from moving around just like it would on the real vehicle. The tank's bow hatches has also been added. They are fully functional and are the exact same hatches that were mentioned in a previous video. The hatches simply get bolted to the tank in these three locations here for each hatch. One modification that I made to the tank that differs from the kit original is that the kit original wants you to use three hex bolts for mounting on the hatches to the top deck. Rather than using the hex bolts for this purpose, on the real Tiger 1, the fasteners are actually mounted with flush mount fasteners, and because of that, no fastener heads were exposed to the top deck. To replicate this look on the model, I went ahead and replaced the hex bolts with uh, countersunk fasteners. First, the plate had its countersunk divots machined into the top deck, and then the countersunk sunk fasteners were added. Once the fasteners were mounted on, I went ahead and plugged up the fastener heads with bodywork and giving them the proper look that we see here, which better replicates that of the real vehicle. With the top deck detailing all done, it's now time to start on the tank's turret. Prior to mounting the top deck on, I went ahead and assembled and fitted the tank's turret rotation motor. The motor and the motor mount that you see here are also applied with the kit and like on all Armor Tech kits are very strong and very nicely done. They're also very easy to assemble and install. One modification that I made to the tank to, in order for the motor, the motor to perform better was that I went ahead and removed a little bit of the brass bushing that we have here. There's a small amount of material that was removed, probably about a sixteenth of an inch or so. With the removal of that material, the gear will spin absolutely free and will have no make contact with any portion of the bushing. Also, one modification that I personally like to make to these tire turner motors, in order to keep them nice and firmly in place, I go ahead and utilize longer fasteners and with the longer fasteners, I also utilize lock washers and nylock fasteners. The purpose of the nylock and the lock washers is that it gives added strength and really keeps the motor in place, preventing it from any type of play as the, the piece is used. The motor was also attached to the tank's RC equipment and is fully functional. The installation was very quick. And as you can see, the motor spins and performs very well. All that remains now is the addition of a thin film of grease along the bushing rim as well as sides. This will be added to the build as the turret progresses. With the top deck and the hull out of the way, I can now focus the rest of my efforts on the tank's turret. The turret that you see here is the stock armor tech turret that has been seen on this tank in all the previous videos. Since the model was acquired, the turret was disassembled and broken down to its basic components in order for me to add the primer, protective primer to the interior portion and exterior portion that we have here. It's all done out of the box with no mods done to this portion here. As you can see, I've already started adding on the coat of Zemerite, which will then progress throughout the rest of the turret sides. More information on the detailing of the turret will follow in the next video. And here's the turret mounted to the model, and I'm going to test the turret rotation. As you can see, the tar rotates nice and smooth, and with the addition of the grease, will probably rotate a lot smoother. And that concludes this project update video for this 1.6 scale, radio-controlled, ArmorTech, late-production German Tiger 1. If you like this video, stop by and like us on Facebook, 
and don't forget to check out eastcoastarmory.com for more 1-6 scale tank builds as well as 1-6 and 1-16 scale detail components. Thank you.